this stuff. Nelson, one question. Yeah. Thanks, I'll just put it. Okay. Uh, there is a question. The organization is asking whether this is going to be. Okay, sure. So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the sixth uh, annual review of Macau Gaming Law. Um, this is an event that was uh, first started at the University of Macau uh, in the framework of the Master in International Business Law in English Language. And uh, the first three editions took place at the old campus of the University of Macau. And um, in 2014, 15, and now we, are, we have the pleasure of being here, uh, being hosted by the Fundação Rui Cunha. And we thank uh, Dr. Rui Cunha and his incredible team for putting together uh, this uh, event. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. The foundation has obviously been doing an excellent job in terms of the study and the, the research and publications on the legal system of Macau. And it's an, a, a work for which uh, Macau in general mm -hmm. should be thankful and the legal community uh, in, in particular. Um, so today uh, the, this session uh, is um, is uh, going to be uh, extremely rich in the sense that uh, we have uh, five speakers. I will be, um, this year I will be just a moderator. And um, so in, in order to give enough time for our speakers to delve on their, on their topics. The session will start uh, with uh, a, a talk with, by Professor Nelson Rose. On, uh, on who's going to deal with the issues relating to the relation between the US uh, and China. I am going to, to, to be as short as possible in order to allow our speakers maximum time. I will simply say that uh, this uh, event is useful uh, for the consolidation of our laws, for the consolidation of our uh, legal system, which is, in fact, a very rich uh, tradition. Um, the regulation of games of chance in Macau uh, uh, started in 1849. It's going to be 170 years old, two years from now. And um, we actually have experimented uh, just about everything. We have experimented with licenses, with concessions, with concessions done in a certain way with certain tax obligations and with other taxes, with that fixed taxation, variable taxation, we have credits for gaming, we have gaming promoters, we have um, a huge uh, uh, reservoir of experience in, in doing this, in, dif this in, in different ways. And this is important not just for us, because we need to constantly uh, ask ourselves in what way our system can be improved, but for other jurisdictions, too, who may study the, the, um, the legal system of Macau uh, for, as, a, as, as that reservoir of experience, which, in fact, it is. It's a very complicated system, but I say complicated in a positive way. It is very rich. And uh, some of this richness is going to be um, uh, touched upon, for especially, I would say, by, by some of the uh, presentations that will come from that side of, of the table. Um, uh, so uh, th this, this is something that other jurisdictions may be interested in looking at. Uh, the, the biggest uh, thing that's happening uh, in recent times in, in gaming in Asia is obviously the fact that Japan in December last year passed a law uh, on uh, 
allowing the, the operation of, of uh, casino games of chance. Well, not casino games of chance. Integrated resorts. Integrated resorts. Integrated resorts. But um, we know a few things about integrated resorts. For example, the Lisboa, uh, which is the result of the concession granted in 1962. We didn't call it an integrated resort. We call it a tourism complex. Um, it's a tourism, tourism complex with a casino on it. What's the difference between a tourism complex with a casino operating and an integrated resort which has a casino? It's just a matter of words. And actually some people now are saying, well, it's not integrated resort, it's entertainment resort, right. which is really something that we know about. And as a matter of fact, you could go, you could go back to the Taihang uh, operation from 1937 to 1961, they had everything, hotel, uh, Fenton houses, restaurants, transportation, entertainment. That sounds like an integrated resort for us. So we, we have all this experience. We, uh, we, are, we, we didn't open our casino seven years ago, like Singapore. We opened our Games of Chance uh, operations 160 years 168 years ago. That's quite a lot. But on the other hand, we, are, we, we should do more to, to, to have this knowledge organized and properly uh, communicated. And this is part, events like today uh, are part of that uh, in order to make our, our experience even, even better known uh, around, around the region. And first and foremost, in order to discuss what is going to be the future evolution of the system. Because it's in the nature of our system that um, every few years there has to be decisions. Every few years uh, it's necessary for the, um, the government, the, the public power, to decide what's going to happen next. For many years it was a, a decision taken taken annually, then it, then it was for longer deadlines, then it was with concessions, and uh, we are approaching very fast uh, a moment uh, in which further decisions will have to be taken so that the system will evolve for its next generation. There will be two presentations that are going to touch upon uh, that. Um, there will be also a presentation on a more specific issue, but a very controversial one, which is the, the smoke ban. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, there is a trend to, to, to stop smoking inside the, the, the gaming areas. Uh, we all in Macau know that this has been uh, the topic of considerable debate. And we also have uh, the opportunity to have a, among us uh, uh, today, uh, Professor Sandro Mendonça from the ISCTE in uh, IUL in Lisbon, who is going also to introduce to us uh, research on, on, um, on, the, on the academic field uh, of gaming. So um, I will come back in the end with some other observations, but uh, uh, I will now pass the floor to Professor Rose for his intervention on uh, what China means to Las Vegas. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think I will stand. Um, I want to thank you. I am seeing some old friends in the audience. I first came to Macau in 1986, um, and I've been teaching at the, with George, at Professor Godino, at the University of Macau in 10 of the last 11 years. Um, uh, for those of you who have seen the development slow, it's, it may seem normal, but it's, it's really fantastic. The danger is um, that Macau is vulnerable, obviously. The, this is a gambling jurisdiction where the regulation of the players is more important than the regulation of the casinos. One of the things I want to show is Las Vegas is now falling into the same situation and with the same patrons, with mainland 
um, Chinese patrons. And since this is our sixth annual update on Macau gaming law, I have to look at what is the most important development. And it's not Macau gaming law, it's the elections in the United States. So um, first, I'm going to be giving a lot of information. So if uh, that's my website, I'm redoing it right now. I haven't yet. Uh, I'm going to post this hopefully after my uh, IP guy redoes it. But there's a lot of information. Feel free to go there. Also, um, send me, if you would like a copy of this, I know it's being streamed, but if you would like a copy of the PowerPoint, send me an email. Um, because I'm going to just put on information. There's no way I can go through all of it. Let's start with how Macau became modern Macau. When the PRC decided to get finally get rid of the bamboo curtain, you know, the Iron Curtain of Asia, I happened to be here. I was teaching uh, in Zhuhai at Sun Yat-sen University uh, in 2004 and happened to come over three weeks after the, the sands opened. Um, and the reason you can get tourists from the mainland was because Beijing changed the visa requirements, that mainland Chinese no longer have to travel in groups. What this did was not only Macau, but the world now depends on Chinese tourists. By far, they are the largest number and the largest spenders of any country in the world, not even counting Hong Kong, which is now 10th on the list of world spenders. So obviously, we all know Macau depends on mainland China. Sometimes you don't realize how big this market is. Macau is one-sixth the size of Washington, D.C., which isn't even a state, and yet by far, it's the largest in, in the world. In fact, it was four years ago that the casinos here surpassed all of the casinos of the United States combined. But when Beijing sneezes, Macau gets pneumonia. Uh, I was here. I had a student who was in charge of frequent visitor program at one of the, um, I think it was an American casino, and in the middle of the semester, she lost her job because those visas restrictions came in where if you were from certain provinces, you could only visit once every three months instead of every day. So there were no frequent visitors anymore. I ran these numbers. I figured this out. Is there any way to judge what the impact of mainland Chinese uh, visitors are on Las Vegas? And there's a great test, blackjack as opposed to to Bacharach. This is how important the Chinese have become to Las Vegas. There are nine times as many blackjack tables as there are Bacharach table in all of Nevada. And the Bacharach tables are basically high stakes, only high stakes tables and only in Las Vegas. The blackjack tables win one point back in 2013 um, won $1.1 billion. The same year, the Bacharach tables, and of course that's the game that the, the Chinese visitors are playing, won half a billion dollars more with only one-ninth the number of tables. They make 150% of, of the blackjack tables. But during the slowdown, Blackjack still makes $1.1 billion, and Nevada, in fact, Las Vegas, lost $400 million. So you can actually measure what the impact is of having fewer mainland Chinese visitors in Las Vegas. And it's not just the high rollers. This is a, an unbelievable headline from 2014. 7,000 tour group, 7,000 person tour group, it took them 86 airplanes, 26 hotels, and the one that I thought was most interesting was each of these 
7,000 tourists spent an average of $10,000 in the United States. Uh, what is that? $70 million for this one tour group. So there shouldn't be any problem. Well, Macau's problem and Nevada's problem is that Donald Trump was elected president. And the, if Macau's symbol is a lotus flower. So if Macau is a lotus flower, China is a dragon, then what is the United States? Well, our symbol normally is an eagle. But if it's an eagle, it's a giant eagle. It's an eagle at least twice the size of the dragon. And you don't want to be a lotus flower if, these, if a giant eagle and a dragon are getting into a fight. First of all, if you're a flower, you can't even move. Um, so the problem is being stepped on accidentally, being collateral damage. Here's the problem with Donald Trump. Giving him the benefit of the doubt, he thinks like a businessman. His only experience is business. He is not a politician or a president or a government ruler. And the, so therefore, he thinks in terms of money and profits. Governments don't look that way. He thinks in terms of businessmen think days, weeks, maybe years. To give you an idea, when the PRC was negotiating with England and Portugal to get back Hong Kong and Macau, they created the two government system, kind of gave Britain and Portugal most of what they wanted. Because China said, in 50 years, we have complete control. If we want to make Macau a province, it's a province. Um, we can wait 50 years. OK, you know, so a government can, can wait 50 years. A business can't wait 50 years and say, OK, let's do, we'll do something and the profit will come in 50 years from now. So his time frame is completely different from those of a government. More importantly, he is the most uninformed president the United States has ever had. He is probably, in fact, the most ignorant leader of any country in the world right now. This is not an opinion. This is a fact. And the reason it is a fact, what happened? Sorry. He doesn't read. And he admits he doesn't read. The problem with not reading is it means he doesn't get information. It's a, just the way human beings co uh, uh, are able to correspond with each other, the way they can get information. You can talk, you can type to give information, but the only way to get large quantities of information is to read. Think about it. everybody in this room. You have done some reading today. You've skimmed over reports. You have looked at thousands and thousands of words. If you don't read, the only information you have is your own personal experience, what you happen to see on television, what you happen to see on the unedited internet, or what somebody, the very few, if you're Donald Trump, the very few people you listen to. Other than that, you literally do not know things. I mean, I, this, he is literally uninformed. If you are uninformed, you step into problems like the one China, two China problem. This is Donald Trump's view from his own experience of this is what he thinks China looks like, Asia looks like. He's got a building project in Taiwan, and he has his shirts made in, on the mainland. From his point of view, there are two Chinas. And from a businessman's point of view, yeah, there are two Chinas. From a government point of view, particularly if you are the government of China, the People's Republic of China, there are not two Chinas, and there have never been two Chinas. If you look at the maps that the PRC made starting in 1949, they always included uh, Formosa, 
Taiwan as part of China. They always included Hong Kong and Macau as part of China. In fact, when Portugal and China, Portugal agreed to give Macau back to the PRC, China refused to sign a treaty. They would not sign a treaty. Instead, they signed an agreement. And the agreement was that the Chinese territory known as Macau, which had been temporarily under control of Portugal, would be returned to the PRC, returned to China. Temporarily is 430 years, OK? So um, China, is, China is China, and it's actually an insult to the people in Beijing to say, well, that uh, Taiwan is a separate country. The third issue, this is the dangerous one. OK, he thinks like a businessman. He doesn't know anything. I want to be very, and you know, I'm fairly lighthearted about most of this stuff. This is very serious. I am a professor of law and an attorney. I often act as a consultant and an expert witness and public speaker on legal issues. I have my Juris Doctor degree from Harvard Law School. I do also have a psychology degree from UCLA. You do not need to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist, though. These are the official medical codes for NPD, Narcissistic Personality Disorder. It, it might be fun to see a guy on television who is falling down drunk, but what if it's not a clown on TV? What if it's an alcoholic and he is the pilot of your airplane? This is very serious because this is a severe mental disorder that Trump has. And here are, here's the medical criteria. Under the uh, World Health Organization, narcissistic personality disorder is described as, you can read, uh, grandiose beliefs and all the rest. Here is um, basically uh, the World Health Organization criteria. To, uh, I, there can't really be any dispute that Donald Trump is not under these disorders, these criteria. The American Psyche, yeah. Yeah, sure. I thought I came here to see you about the You will. He knows that. Right. But We're getting there. Be, Please let me finish. In the American Psychiatric Association, it's called the Diagnostic Statistical uh, Manual Number Five. They say if you have five of these nine criteria. then you are narcissistic personality disorder. So what does it mean for Macau? It means there is inevitable clash coming. The one problem is our president revels in hitting back. These are quotes. He, he says you should always escalate. The Chinese believe in saving face. Part of saving face, if you look at the Chinese soap operas, you know it always includes revenge. So there is a danger of escalation. Where will the escalation lead to? One possibility is an actual shooting war. We came close with the South China Sea. Um, and during the formal hearing for Secretary of State State Tillerson, he said that he would prevent the Ch China from building the artificial islands in the South China Sea, where the oil and natural gas is, and he would prevent China from using those islands. That means he was willing to say that the United States would use military force 
who prevent China from going onto land that it is claiming. That's an act of war. He has never said that again. He has backed out. Tillerson reads, I don't think we're going to have a shooting war with China. I think there is a very good possibility of a trade war. The danger for Macau is will the, if there is a dispute, a trade war between mainland China and the United States, will it mean at the, those visa restrictions again? Personally, I think actually what will happen is that um, China will simply cut out its orders to Boeing. Um, there is a competitor. There's Airbus. I noticed that uh, China now is building aircraft um, factories, so it's possible that it won't be gaming. But if it is gaming, it's a natural fit for China to say, OK, Donald Trump, you're refusing to back down. You're insulting us. You're whatever the problem is. Um, and, and again, relations now are pretty good. Who knows what they'll be in a month or two. If there is this type of a fight, then think about in the United States and in Asia, we connect the name Trump with casinos. Unfortunately, two of his biggest supporters are Steve Wynn and Sheldon Adelson. Sheldon Adelson, in fact, is the largest contributor in, to political campaigns in American history. If China wanted to send a message, if they get into this some sort of a fight and we get into a trade war, it would be really simple for them to say, we're putting in visa restrictions again. No travel to Nevada, no travel to Macau. Now, this unfortunately would hit, obviously would hit everybody in Macau, um, and hopefully none of this will happen. The biggest danger, the reason everybody is so scared, is North Korea. China is really the only power on Earth that has some influence under Kim Jong-un. There doesn't seem to be anyone who can control Donald Trump. And the idea of having two people, two leaders of two countries who appear to be really severely unstable with nuclear weapons, yeah, that, that is really scary. So on that very positive note, um, I'm, I am sorry that I brought this uh, down, but we're, everybody is kind of pussyfooting around this. It is a real danger, and both Macau and Las Vegas could be collateral damage. Let's hope it does not happen. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, <clears throat> Professor Rose. And uh, we will be going through the various presentations in sequence, and uh, we'll have the Q&A session for everybody in the end. So now, with further ado, I will pass the floor to uh, Professor Sandro Mendonça, who is going to talk about academic research, gaming, and innovation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, the first word of thanks to Professor George Goudinho, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the path to this moment has been long. It all started with a conversation with uh, Dr. Rui Cunha, to whom I, I thank and to his team at the foundation. Um, the conversation started by uh, noticing that uh, we could do two things. First, uh, we could try and do a proof of concept that intelligence on gambling, on the gambling business, can be done cheaply and effectively, uh, assuming that, in fact, for a territory like this, in intelligence on the industry matters. And uh, the second uh, idea was that uh, generalization matters, especially if you are, uh, say, a scholar or a researcher. Um, you should try and uh, see the background, just as Professor Nelson Rose just did, 
for us and to uh, cut through uh, the fog and the short term. So <clears throat> what we have here is an attempt to do some, uh, some research. And what I did was I enlisted some of my students, my master students, to do uh, some, uh, some research through term papers. And they were happy to do. Of course, we noticed that uh, gambling in, in, in Portugal, uh, this was done at my uh, university, uh, if it, it's not on the everyday agenda, but it, it uh, puts a spark on uh, people's uh, eyes. So it was easy to motivate them. So the, the argument is that uh, we could uh, set up an indicator from existing evidence and systematically treat uh, s uh, something that is out there that professionals don't use uh, so much, um, which is um, academic journal publications using research papers as an indicator in themselves, meaning that sometimes to understand stuff, we do analysis. If you don't know enough, which is my case, you study other people's work, but systematically it means that you can even quantify trends and turns and start building up an infrastructure for further understanding, including anticipation. So uh, in my presentation, I'll go through uh, some preliminary uh, points uh, that uh, have to do with the motivation of this agenda. What, what are we using uh, to uh, tell a story? And then going into the style aspects. Well, so <clears throat> this is uh, an attempt to building up uh, an intelligence uh, mechanism by um, uh, doing analysis on other people's analysis. Uh, so we know that uh, gambling is uh, a very splintered uh, thing, it changes quite a lot. Uh, when you have an industry like that, it's really hard to uh, uh, monitor uh, the evolution of such a system. It also happens that um, uh, change uh, is faster on the ground than on uh, the research uh, setting. So usually the researchers should be looking ahead, right? But they are not many times. And there is a gap between uh, scholarly research and uh, professionals. So <clears throat> we could uh, try and um, uh, correct some of the, the, the biases and gaps that we have in both communities by uh, leveraging uh, on uh, insights and, and, and fragmented uh, data with the obvious, <clears throat> obvious benefit of uh, trying to um, uh, design better policy guidelines. So th that will be the motivation. So what we do. Uh, <clears throat> in innovation economics, which is the corner from which I come from, uh, many times we use uh, proxy measures, so indirect measures, because the phenomena are just uh, sometimes not accessible. Uh, because, for, for instance, they're secretive, like in pharmaceutical industry, you can pick up patents. Uh, in other areas like uh, uh, services, uh, because you cannot see the products or wait for the products, sometimes you use another uh, indicator, uh, which is an advanced indicator called branding or trademarks, which are intellectual property rights. So you can use this data. What we did here was to bring bibliometrics to gambling studies. So bibliometrics is just the systematic study of uh, research publications. So we did that uh, just picking one journal, one academic journal. And there are rankings for journals. Uh, what I did, uh, I, I went to a big database of journals, which is one of the standards. It's called Scopus. It's compiled by Elsevier, which is a huge um, global uh, publisher of science. And I um, 
uh, ranked those uh, and um, came up with the international gambling studies. So fortunately, uh, Professor uh, Rose knows what I'm talking about in a very peculiar way because he was an editor of uh, such a journal. So journals are the key vehicles for scholarly research. If you publish, you have a career. If you don't publish, you are out. And uh, what we did was we went back to uh, 2010 and we compiled all the uh, research articles. There are stuff that is published that is, is not actually a research article. They are editorials, they are uh, notes, so we just went to the core and we um, uh, grabbed one, uh, almost 200 uh, papers and we went through uh, the contents. So that adds up to uh, lots of pages. And we had to, uh, so we needed a team uh, for that. And there was some double checking going on. For instance, I was <laughs> double checking and uh, troubleshooting when we didn't know how to interpret. But to interpret, you need a sort of uh, framework. So first we had to design a, a framework. Well, I will not bother with uh, the, the, uh, the, the framework because it's not so special. What we did was to uh, um, come up with a bunch of categories. Some are uh, get, uh, obtained from the literature. So there is the Oxford Handbook of uh, Gambling Studies. And we took that uh, recent volume to, for instance, um, uh, uh, establish this sort of uh, segmentation in the industry. And we could have used your, your recent book, it would be even uh, better. But anyway, so if we take this, uh, for instance, one, um, one insight is that this journal, which is, I mean, for our purposes, the leading journal, um, is very interested uh, into um, the propensity of uh, gambling to, to change per se, only seldom they are specific about uh, certain trades, like the casino trade or uh, lotteries, etc., etc. So sometimes they are quite general. Sometimes even the, 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 the research papers are not so useful because the, the researcher pretends is actually getting into some general point. Sometimes they are not. One thing that was surprising uh, uh, from here was the market share of scholarly attention that new gaming uh, attracted. So I was surprised to see that the digital component of uh, uh, gambling research is quite high. So many times the object of analysis um, is now digital, electronic, um, and then even the names uh, are evolving as, as time goes by. So now we, have, uh, we, we can uh, see words uh, propping like sharing or uh, uh, uberization of, of gambling, uh, many things, you know, uh, the, the proliferation of screens everywhere in, in the palm of the hands of gamblers in, 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 in the casino setups, in the very architecture of, of the game. So this was one insight. So there is structural change in terms of the segments. Some of them are growing. Another thing was uh, this. This was, uh, for me, a, a surprising uh, finding, but not so surprising if you understand the journal. So this journal is not a journal that goes to the phenomena on an even, uh, with even ends. Now they, 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 they emphasize the demand sector. They, de they emphasize the demand sector because many, or most of the authors, they, they come from psychology. And this probably is not neutral if you understand the source of financing of research. Because you see uh, that in the footnotes, in, in, in the little print, 
you see many times who is funding, and sometimes we have institutions that are concerned with uh, psychological uh, uh, problems uh, that are associated with, with gambling. Anyway, uh, there are uh, some um, trends that are underneath uh, these. In the future, of course, as we expand the research and we add up more journals, and we go back in time, we can have more powerful uh, insights. Well, it's interesting to go through uh, the uh, sub-trends. So uh, what are the uh, peculiar topics that are, that have, um, are being researched? Of course, uh, the demand side is mostly consumption. And you see a lot. So consumption is defined um, on an individual basis. Some uh, studies, however, emphasize context. And these people are not psychologists. They are sociologists. Sometimes you see these. Or social psychologists. Some people emphasize the human element. But they are talking about people inside uh, the, the gambling firms. So this is another, another area. When we talk about marketing definitely and marketing innovation, we, we see that we are talking about the supply side. And it's not uh, often that we see uh, research just on regulation. For instance, just on governance, just on law, and not in this, in this journal. And this is a, a journal, for instance, in which people from the University of Macau business department, they, they publish here. Like Davis, Professor Davis Fong has published here. So this is a, a, a reputable uh, journal. Um, what are the areas uh, of the world that, have, that are being covered? Well, uh, the usual suspects. So uh, we have lots of people talking about what is going on in North America and in Europe, and there is a correlation between their object of analysis and their nationality. All right? So there is a bias here, and we can see that Asia, that now is uh, driving lots of the action, is still uh, not so well represented. So that means there is an opportunity also for people that want to explore Asia to uh, gain market share because that's really uh, performing uh, below the, the, the market share of the, the global um, uh, gambling, gambling phenomena. Whoops. All right, so um, th these were just some highlights. And the, the major points I would like to, to stress, because this was just a prototype uh, study, is that uh, uh, we know that uh, gambling, like many other things today, can be seen from the perspective of big data. But even research on gambling, because now it's quite extensive, can be seen as big data. So we will need more uh, sophisticated type of analysis to even go through uh, this material. One, one peculiar thing is to find out what are the most uh, uh, influential articles, something that we can do in the future, so the most cited articles, to see what are the emerging patterns. Uh, so uh, uh, this means that we can also uh, see um, what is going on now, but we can see more about the future. So we also uh, depict instances in which new business models are on the rise. For instance, it's not just that the digital component is increasing in many types of games, but it's the, the digital that is becoming the medium. So all the games uh, will probably have an infrastructural uh, digital uh, element. Uh, th this means that probably the suppliers of gambling solutions will, will change. So, and, and Israel comes to mind, for instance. Um, we still don't know much about this side, I mean the industry side, in the industry in the sense of the the, uh, the firms that organize gambling. Uh, we don't know a, a lot about Asia, which is a paradox. 
And um, using this sort of uh, uh, approach, probably we could have more evidence-based policy, which is a thing uh, uh, I, uh, I think we, we need, because one thing that uh, we did was to analyze all the studies, uh, deploying a grid of categories, but the last one uh, were policy implications. And we see uh, situations in, in which policy implications converge, other situations in which policy uh, implications diverge. Uh, diversions can be uh, a measure of uncertainty. Nobody knows what to do. And sometimes conversions can uh, be a commonplace. People that are too certain of, uh, uh, they are too certain like generals were certain they, they were certain they were fighting the last war, right? So sometimes we, we see all of this. So I think this is an interesting agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sandro Mendonça. And without further ado, I will pass the floor to Dr. Sergio de Almeida Correa, who will talk to us about how to deal with the subconcessions of games of chance. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say thanks to Professor George Gooding and also to the Rui Cunha Foundation for having invited me for this moment. Unfortunately, I did not prepare any PowerPoint. I know that uh, to talk about law is never a funny thing, but uh, I believe that what I have to tell you will be enough to keep your attention. Okay, considering the time limitations we have, and in order to give time to everybody here and to allow the opportunity to take questions from the floor, I will summarize only the main points related to the title I gave to this brief presentation. According to Article 7 of the Law 16-2001, and following the customary practice in 1999 post Macau, the legal administrative institution of the concession bound the activities related to the casino gaming industry. The administrative concession contract for the operation of games of fortune or chance, as everybody knows, is defined as the administrative contract by which the administration allows a private person in our case, an SA company to operate or maintain and operate a casino gaming premise by remunerating himself from gaming revenues and providing a financial compensation to the grantor. Pursuant to Article 165 of the Macau Administrative Procedure Code, the concession of the casino gaming operations shall be made under a contract negotiated between the Macau SAR the grantor and the concessionaire. Paragraph second of the Article 1st of Law 16, 2001, stipulates that the legal regime aims in particular to ensure, first, proper exploitation and operation. Second, the suitability of those involved in oversight, management and operation. Third, to secure operation under conditions of justice and honesty, and free from criminal influence, as well as protection of Macau SAR interests. Fourth, at the same time, the operation will aid to promote tourism, social stability, and most important, economic development. However, unique to the Macau system is the fact that by law, the maximum number of allowable concessions, concessions is three. Despite this, the direct of operation of casino gaming is undertaken by six entities, formally. Three concessionaires and three sub-concessionaires. The first problem of this regime is that, upon my view, the legal regime of concessions derives from the general law, meaning in this situation Law 390M of May 14, which defines the general basis of concessions 
by virtue of Article 26, and based on this regime, subconcessions are meant only for public works and public services. Why? Because gaming concessions are not included in the said law, due to the specific regime included in the Law 16, 2001. We cannot find the word subconcession in the latest and in our public law, we are not allowed to presume that is written in the law what is not there. Besides, if it was idea of the legislator to have more than three operators, then this would have been included in the law. It's not the case. And I remember that in 1982, the, the number foreseen in law 682M was four operators. So, in light of the provisions of the above mentioned Article 165, there would be no legal basis for subconcessions in casino gaming industry. This is nothing new, and I am not the first saying it. But so far, the Macau government has ignored it, and at a certain moment, the former Secretary of Economy and Finances tried to justify what is, in, upon my view, is unjustifiable in legal terms. We all know that the current concessions will end between 2020 and 2022. In the case of SJM, the current contract expires on March 30, 2020 and the other two concessionaires, Galaxy Casino and Win, both have their contracts expiring on June 2020. Consequently, under normal conditions, the subconcessions will expire on March 31, 2020 for MGM and on June 2022 for Melco and Venetian. At this point, I will not enter into the discussion to know if casino gaming should be considered as a public service, a service of public interest, or a non-essential public service. And I rely on what was written some time ago by Professor George Gooding. What we know is that, first, casino gaming is a legal issue of high complexity a public activity in the reserved area of government and an essential area of the Macau economy and for the well-being of its community. Second, the present concessions can be exceptionally extended up to a term of five years more. See Article 13, Number 3 of Law 16, 2001. Third, being exceptionally, the extension of each concession, if it is the case, needs to be justified in reasonable terms and agreed with the subconcessionaires. Fourth, with or without extension of the term, in any case, we need to deal with subconcessions. And at this point, we return to the beginning, how to deal with subconcessions. I would say that subconcessions raise three fundamental problems. First one derives from the particular contractual instrument used that allows for the extension of certain obligations beyond the date of termination of the concession contracts on which they depend. This is contrary to what is common practice and is not a result of the classic administrative legal framework applicable to subconcessions. To clarify, Clause 94 of the subconcession contracts states that the termination of the concessions does not imply the termination of the subconcessions. This is a genuine legal aberration, which is understandable, understandable given the circumstances of the time, 
The continuity clauses for subconcessions beyond the final deadlines set in the gaming concession regime are no longer acceptable. It should be corrected as soon as possible so that this situation does not recur. Essentially, it is a technical legal problem that, if corrected, would not expose any major risk to the interests of the Macau SAR. Second, a different and much more acute problem arises from the answer to the question of whether the current regime of subconcessions is in the interests of Macau SAR. On this subject, it seems that the answer is unequivocal negative. The current regime of subconcessions is clearly detrimental to Macau's interests because the proceeds from the agreement to establish of the subconcession which should go directly into the, the Macau SAR Treasury strong boxes will eventually end up in the pockets of brokers and intermediaries who use the licenses granted by the Macau SAR government to negotiate the terms of the subconcessions. In other words, the grantor, who is the Macau SAR government, is marginalized from these negotiations and takes no advantage from the income generated by an agreement prior to the commencement of casino operations of the subconcession, and which terms it does not control, upon my view. The existing system seriously penalizes the interests of the Macau SAR, and by the same token, the interests of the People's Republic of China. Why? Because it lacks transparency, and therefore is also contrary to the financial interests of Macau and of the requirements of greater transparency and accountability in public affairs. Third, the third question to which the Macau SAR government will have to determine a response is whether or not the continuation of the existing concessionaires and subconcessionaires should be maintained and whether or not their numbers should increase. To this point, it should be remembered that gaming is a public service in Macau, as as, uh, as, uh, as written by Professor George Goodin. Perhaps not in most of other regions or countries that do not depend so much on gaming as Macau. Being a public service in Macau, any change implies a revision of Law 16, 2001. This issue will have to be defined with these guidelines in mind sometime in advance, because the future will depend on it. At this point, we don't know if it is of the interest of the Macau government to continue with the present gaming legal regime or to change it. If the intention is to continue, then these changes should be prepared with enough time. For now, what can be said is that there is no advantage from subconcessions to the Macau SAR. And it is not justifiable to have subconcessionaires as well as junkets behaving as if they were the license holders into the future. In the past, as pointed out by someone else, the Macau government has tolerated partnerships between commas, of course, beyond any legal basis. I remember the decision of case 921 from the former Macau Superior Court of Justice issued on November 25, 1998. I wouldn't like to see it again in the future. In conclusion, I would say that it is important to realign the bizarre de facto reality of the present day subconcessions with the legal logic of the Macau law and in the interests of the Macau SAR by not allowing the continuation of subconcessions beyond the current deadlines. 
In any case, it is therefore appropriate to plan for the future and to review from now on the existing legal regime. If necessary, by extending the number of concessions to allow direct allocation and to keep the six operators, if it is the case. It is important to put an end to the present subconcession system in order to avoid potentially conflicts of interests and other corrupt practices. This solution is balanced. It respects the interests of the present subconcessionaires. Since I propose the enlargement of the number of concessionaires, and is in line with the actions of the PRC and President Xi Jinping to fight undesirable situations that undermine the power of the state and the ethical and moral authority of those that govern vis-a-vis -vis the government. And finally, just before finish, I would like to point out a final remark related to subconcessionaires but that respects also concessionaires and is related to the reversion of the assets to the Macau SAR at the end of the concessions. I heard that this is causing some apprehension, some doubts, and I would like to take this opportunity to clarify how do I see it. Having in mind the present regime, at the end of the concessions and subconcessions, the casinos with all equipment and utensils will reverse to the Macau SAR, Article 40 of Law 16, 2001. The immovables with the hotels and malls are private property. And this is one of the conditions mentioned in the contracts. The casinos must be located in properties owned by the concessionaires and subconcessionaires. I refer to clauses 42 of the contracts. So, in what concerns the, what Professor Gooding called the integrated resorts or tourism complex, meaning the hotels and its surroundings, in case of extinction of the concessions and subconcessions, concessionaires and subconcessionaires may always face the legal expropriation. And they must be prepared for this. But of course, this is subject to compensation. Please check the last paragraph of Article 103 of the Basic Law. As I said, we don't know at this time, at this moment, what Macau government will decide, but uh, must be clear that nobody can have the guarantee that the concessions will continue in the future following the present model. I know that what I said is not exempt of discussion, and I'm sure that there is a lot of people that see these things in a different way. So I'd like to conclude quoting Confucius that at these moments is always a source of inspiration. The scholar who cherishes the love of comfort is not fit to be deemed a scholar. I thank you all and every one of you. Thank you very much. And, uh, we will move on to the next speaker, Dr. Bruno Beato Ascensão, who will speak about Macau Gaming concessions, a brief insight into their term and renewal. The floor you. is yours. Thank you Thank so you, much. Professor Godinho. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, for the brief, for being here. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Rui Cunha work that the Foundation has done for Macau, for the work, for the legal works, for its identity. Um, I also would like to greet my fellow colleagues of the panel. And um, <clears throat> so 
further to um, my colleague Sergio uh, uh, intervention, there are many things which I agree with. I will try to um, explore other other things that may happen. I, I need I need to start with a declaration of interest. I, I do not have access to um, confidential information. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, it, it may Never come asked. as a disappointment. Never asked. It may come as a disappointment if uh, if what I say or many things that I say do not come true. Um, but um, it's um, it's honest thinking, and it's um, some reflection of, of the little information available and um, I think it's logical logical um, a logical search for logical solutions uh, in light of the existing uh, regulation before starting I, I just want to mention that I, I saw I wrote an, an article which you can read on in the Asian gaming lawyer edition of this of this month um, I, I I talk I talk about what the current subconcessions are uh, in light of the um, the gaming law and, and, and what the substantial of their so substantial nature and the problems that may arise if 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 this um, if, if, if they're their legal status if they're not um, addressed properly. And, um, and so <coughs> that is, that, that's what I, I, I basically explore in the article. And I'd wish to talk about, uh, give more um, light to, to on what can um, come ahead. How can the Macau government address the the term of the uh, gaming concessions and uh, and, um, and possibly uh, amend the gaming law. And before and before uh, raising some thoughts, I'd like to uh, mention some figures. And one striking figure about uh, the gaming industry in Macau is its its sheer scale. It's the um, it's the fact that in 2015, which was considered a very bad year for gaming, um, the gross gaming revenue was of 28.4 billion US dollars. Um, so compared with 2013 and, and 2014, where the uh, the same gross gaming revenue was 45.2. And 44 billion for the years 2013 and 2014. I mean, we can see that 2015 was was not a good year. But nonetheless, the the, the percentage of the fiscal revenue uh, represents 77 percent of the total fiscal revenue in Macau, which is huge and and gives um, an idea of how important this uh, industry is for Macau. There's another. Uh, there's another figure that is very important to um, to put things in perspective, which is the fact that this gaming industry uh, employs directly one fifth of the workforce in Macau, and that's and that's um, that's potentially dangerous. Um, dangerous in the sense that if there is a crisis, it can cause serious civil unrest. And it's also something to um, consider when um, when the renegotiation or when the the concessions uh, will, if they ever end. So this will happen, and the government will decide. Um, the fate of the uh, gaming concessions in accordance with um, obviously central government directives. It will be, it will not be done uh, individually. It will be done in accordance and jointly with the uh, central government. 
And the first thing that we should address or think about is look at the current status quo and as my colleague uh, Sergio referred, is, is it really necessary, should we address the amendment of the gaming law in order to, um, in order to change the maximum number of concessionaires from three to six? Because undoubtedly, um, although, although called sub-concessionaires, um, it is almost certain I am almost certain that um, current subconcessions are actually uh, concession contracts and therefore should be considered as concessionaires. Um, therefore, uh, an amendment of the law would uh, prevent the mistake of having further subconcessions in the future. So, uh, I think many of you know why the figure of the subconcession arose. Um, it, it all has to do with facts that can be explained between the period of 2002 and 2006. I don't think it's necessary to dwell on that, but um, it would be, so the amendment would have um, the, the advantage of solving uh, uh, an issue that wasn't properly solved and granting safety and and um, safety to the to the to a gaming industry which is fundamental to Macau um, by approving such amendment the, I, I don't intend to say that uh, the government should or would uh, definitely uh, grant six gaming concessions. Um, it, it has the uh, power not to grant all six. Uh, this obviously will have to um, be taken into consideration with um, the circumstances of, of what will happen when this has to be addressed. Uh, although, I need to stress that not having six gaming concessionaires will necessarily have to um, guarantee full employment to those who, who work now and will work then. Um, and so that is the, the reason why I, I, I stress the point of the importance of the six gaming concessionaires um, employing one-fifth of Macau's population, possibly more, in the time to come. The term of the um, future gaming concessions. Okay, so what I was talking about the amendment of the gaming law. What, what can happen? Can, the government can do, can do a lot of things, but it can, it can even amend the law and say that the current gaming concessions can be renewed. But if it does that, it doesn't solve the, the problems of the sub-concessions. And in my opinion, that would be a mistake. Um, furthermore, when we talk about amending the gaming law, we, we are talking about submitting a draft to the Legislative Assembly and have it approved by the Legislative Assembly. Especially in a, in a matter which is as delicate as the number of concessions, there are many members of the Legislative, uh, leg legislative Assembly which are um, interested parties in, in one of such concessions. So um, having it approved will be a very delicate um, procedure which will have to be addressed with, um, with, uh, with a lot of delicacy by the government and uh, with very strong lobbying from the central government in order to have this approved. Um, and so even though the, the question of the renew or not, or not renewing the current gaming concessions um, 
uh, is a is a is also a possibility. Like I said, I don't think it's it solves the issue of the subconcessions. Um, also, regarding the length of gaming concessions, um, the reason why in, 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 in back in 2002 gaming concessions were given a period of 20 years was because the liberalization of the gaming market was was at, was 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 starting, and gaming concessionaires would uh, would need to. <coughs> to build uh, those these integrated resorts. And obviously this would take time and they would need to have also time to have a return on their investments. Now, considering that most of the um, integrated resorts are built or, or uh, nearing approve, um, uh, nearing uh, inauguration, um, it, it, may, it may not make sense of having new gaming concessions with a 20-year period span. Um, there's one interesting fact uh, regarding this issue, which could, uh, regarding potential, so SJM and its sub-concessionaire MGM have, M MGM will have, currently have its integrated resort approved this year. SJM is forecast to open next year. And funny, funny, funny enough, they're the ones who have their gaming concessions and sub-concessions uh, terminated in 2020. So uh, the return on investment will be uh, delicate uh, unless, unless, uh, they have had uh, assurance from the government that their gaming concessions will not be terminated. But, uh, like I said, this is not public information, so I'm just speculating. Um, in any case, um, this being a highly lucrative um, activity, possibly those investments will be uh, paid before the end of the, uh, uh, each contract. But um, but so uh, the twenty year term can be easily um, changed to a five year term, which would make much more sense. Um, five year term would uh, would uh, easily coincide with uh, the term of the chief executive, which could um, adapt its policy for the term um, with the. Um, with the negotiation of each gaming concession. Um, and, um, and so, by also one thing that should be done and was not done in 2002 and 2006 is um, demand from the gaming concessionaires and sub-concessionaires, in this case concessionaires, to to uh, um, to demand more obligations from from their willingness to participate in such a lucrative market. Um, I, I just mentioned before, uh, and this is public information, and uh, several uh, representatives of local concessionaires have addressed the. Uh, Possibility of investing in 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 the in Japan by doing whatever it takes to enter that market. So, whoever wishes to do whatever it takes to enter Japan could uh, easily do whatever it takes to remain in Macau. And and um, and this would be an interesting way for. For 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 the Macau government to to um, recover lost opportunities, uh, namely by asking more in in um, in the um, obligations that the gaming concessionaires would uh, would give to the uh, to the MSAR. Um, I could think of. Um, Numerous uh, 
matters in which they could be more present. Um, for instance, as major employers in Macau, they could uh, vow to create uh, more childcare assistance or even housing construction for their own employees, subsidizing higher educational institutions, especially those that seek to further Macau's economic diversification, or even adopt an extensive and comprehensive environmentally friendly policies that would help reduce carbon emissions resulting from the op operation of the integrated resorts, which would include promoting the use of electric buses, the implementation of infrastructure works on renewable projects, setting an adequate inf waste infrastructure, delivery program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, the Macau government didn't ask for um, special architectural projects, but could ask for uh, possibly more meaningful um, cooperation from the um, gaming concessionaires. Um, and so, we all, so this is, I, I can, I understand that many people have already thought of this. So the problem is, when uh, should the gaming concessions terminate, or, or, or when should they be renegotiated? And in order for this to make sense, uh, this would have to coincide with the... Um, with the uh, initial term of a chief executive's office. And um, so for negotiation purpose, it would make sense to extend uh, SJMs and MGM contracts until 2022. And two possibilities can, can, can open up. Um, it's important to state that President Xi Jinping's term will end if renewed next year in 2023. Um, we all know that it's a, a two-year term, so it's, it, he's only, he can only serve for two terms, which means that uh, from 2023 onwards, there will be a new president of uh, DRC. And therefore, it's... It's, it is possible that um, the renegotiation of the contracts may start as soon as 2020 and to be achieved in 2022. Or um, the second generation of gaming concession could be pushed back to the 2025-2027 period. Uh, and, and this would be possible because, because of the... Um, as my colleague Sergio explained, um, the concession contracts can be exceptionally postponed, uh, extended until for five years. So it would end in 2020, uh, in 2027, which which would allow would allow the um, chief executive, which whose term would start in the end of 2024, and the new president of the PRC to um, to handle uh, this matter in, in accordance with the um, the instructions of of that uh, of that term. So I, I'm also aware that many other factors can influence the outcome of what I've just said. Um, uh, there can be a crisis, internal, external. There can be economic or geopolit geopolitical. Um, circumstances that change all of this. Uh, but um, uh, quoting Harold Wilson, was a, which was a former British Prime Minister, a week, if a week is a long time in politics, I would add that uh, in this case, five years is hardly quantifiable. So thank you for listening. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to the last um, speaker, Dr. Francisco Gaivão, who will uh, speak about the 
evolving the law and policy on smoking in, in, in the casinos in Macau. Thank you, Professor Godinho. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to join my colleagues in um, thanking the Fundação Rui Cunha and uh, its principal and, and founder, Dr. Rui Cunha, uh, because uh, it's my honor to, to participate in, in, in this debate for the first time here in, um, in, an, insti in, a, in an institution that is really um, an example for everybody. And uh, it's never enough that we should thank Dr. Cunha for his vision and generosity uh, in setting up this foundation that is such a huge contribution to, to the law in Macau, to the law community in Macau. Um, as, uh, as Professor Goodinho said, I'm going to uh, address a very specific um, issue um, of, of Macau law um, that is the object of my attention, and um, I have a few uh, uh, ideas and a few comments based on my uh, professional experience, and I thought that perhaps could be interesting to share this with you and um, throw some ideas and and, and after that, we, we, we could perhaps have a discussion over this issue that I think it's, it's not yet sufficiently um, enough uh, discussed uh, amongst us, uh, you know, legal persons of Macau. Uh, and it is precisely the, the tobacco control laws um, and its application to, to casinos because uh, one of the most important and most discussed aspects of this law is how the, um, it's the, the section that addresses uh, casinos and the implementation uh, of this law uh, to, to the industry of casinos. As we know, the, the, the current law was passed in 2011, and in terms of uh, application to casinos, that law set a term of the beginning of 2013 for casinos to create 50% of its gaming area smoke-free, uh, which they did uh, all by January uh, 1st, 2013, all the casinos and, and, and gaming machines, uh, saloons, had 50% of the area uh, smoke-free. Uh, the law didn't uh, allow casinos to have um, almost total freedom in terms of determin determining which areas would be um, smoke-free, that the casinos could perhaps opt for 100% of the 50% to be VIP, or 100% uh, could be mass, or they could have a mixed solution, which I think all of them did. Um, um, uh, and this was basically the regime that was uh, uh, set up uh, by the law uh, of 2011, in, in force from January 2013. But as so many times happens in Macau, um, right after the implementation of this regime, we all, we all remember, um, we saw some um, you know, sectors of, of, of the community criticizing the law, saying that the casinos were given um, perhaps um, a too good treatment with this legal solution. One, in fact, was not exactly like that. I remember that one of the first, one of the drafts of the law um, uh, that I saw prior to, to the law of 2011, uh, I believe uh, one, of, one, one of the initial proposals was 70% um, of, um, of, ca of casino area that could be smoking and, and the obligation was only for 30% of the area to be smoke free. But in, in the end, it was the 50-50 solution that, that came up in 2011. But, but as I said, um, it was almost immediate that um, you know some sectors of the of the society would criticizing uh, the government and the solution, saying that they were being uh, too nice to, to the casinos, allowing them to have 50% of the area um, smoke-free. So it was almost immediately that the government was, you know, as, as, as it happened so many times in Macau, saying that the law was already under revision, it would be, it would be uh, revised and a solution that would content those sex sectors of the of the popula of the population and and and, and those groups um, uh, would probably uh, be um, passed soon. Um, so, in 2014 October, um, an, an amendment to the law was passed 
uh, that basically stated that the smoking areas of the casinos could only be located in the so-called VIP rooms or VIP saloons. Uh, so um, it was still under the framework of 50-50, but it had to be, you know, within an enclosed room with partitioning from ceiling to, to floor, um, thus allowing a total separation from the, uh, from the open areas of, of the casinos. Of course, we need to put this into context because, you know, changes to the law um, in every part of the world uh, happen as a result of discussions, of debates, and, and, and negotiations in, in so many times. And it was the case of this amendment of 2014 to the smoking laws. There was an understanding between the government and, uh, and the gaming operators um, um, under which um, the casinos would be allowed to change their uh, layouts of the casinos and set up those, you know, those rooms, those, um, um, you know, um, VIP rooms or, or limited access rooms. I believe this is what, what one of the regulations, uh, the term used uh, with partitioning from ceiling to, to the floor. Um, the casinos would be allowed to, to set up those areas, thus allowing them to move the smoking those areas of the casinos where the smoking would be, you know, confined there. Uh, the problem was the law was passed, but apparently the government didn't keep their part of, of the bargain. The casinos did set up those areas. We all remember what happened in 2014. They, they, they created those cages inside the main gaming floors uh, of all the big casinos in Kotai. But in the last minute, they were told by the government that they wouldn't allow smoking there. Um, and, um, and so suddenly, the, the, all the area of the casinos that previously was smoking approved was no longer smoking approved because it was no longer partitioned. Uh, and those VIP rooms that, the, um, that all the casinos built uh, were not allowed to have smoking. The government said, this is not located in VIP. We will not allow that to happen which resulted in a big reduction of the, of, the, of, the gaming, of the smoking area, of the gaming area that is smoking allowed. But also, um, all the new casinos that meanwhile opened since 2014, Sans Kotai Central, Galaxy F Phase 2, Studio City, The Parisian, Wind Palace, all those casinos were not allowed by the government to set up smoking areas in accordance with, 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 the, with the standing legislation. They were told that they could not set up VIP rooms or private saloons or private access areas where smoking would be allowed because the law, I think the explanation that was given was the law was already being, um, the government was already considering a further review of the law that would contemplate um, uh, another restriction and perhaps a total ban. So all these casinos that meanwhile open in Kotai, you know, across the street from the City of Dreams and, and, and the Venetian and the Galaxy Phase 1 that have smoking, have operated for years in, 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 a, in a tremendous compet competitive disadvantage because they were never allowed to have smoking. Um, and and this, is, this, this is what happened. Um, and recent statements uh, of the government uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, have re have re uh, recent positions of the government have resulted uh, in the government um, preparing another draft, a further amendment of the, um, of the tobacco controls law that um, you know, regulates um, you know, other aspects of, of the tobacco control law, such as the electronic cigarette for the first time the electronic cigarette will have a legal framework in Macau. But again, the, um, the most important and, and most salient um, aspect of this law, and I believe that the main objective is to create another restriction to, to casino smoke. And, and the first draft that the government submitted to the LESCO contemplated, as we, as we remember and as we saw, 
a, a total ban of, uh, of uh, casino, for casino smoke. Of course, the, um, the industry of, uh, of gaming and the gaming operators were, were alarmed. And um, I think that almost everybody, uh, except perhaps the, some, some people in the health department of, of the Macau government, thought that that draft of bill was completely unreasonable. And um, to have in Macau, to think that the big integrated resorts casinos, as, as we've called them tonight, uh, of the Kotai Strip would be totally smoking free with a further prohibition of casinos to operate airport style um, smoking lounges would be, would be completely crazy. Would, would put Macau, I mean, completely against the trend uh, of all the gaming jurisdictions in the world, in fact. Um, and I, I think that the majority of the legislators that, that saw that didn't agree, didn't agree with it. And, and, and the government was um, told that perhaps uh, a further uh, revision of, of their draft would be advisable, and, and this is what happened. So uh, I believe currently the um, uh, second draft of the proposed uh, amendment to the tobacco control bill uh, is pending in, in, in the LESCO, and uh, as far as we know, it contemplates the possibility of casinos to have the um, airport-style smoking lounges. But because the first draft was so radical, and, it, and, 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 and the, the concessionaires were so afraid of what they saw, um, I believe they have missed the main issue, which is they would lose the possibility to operate gaming with smoking. We're talking about, so, and sometimes the debate in Macau is very confusing because people, um, people refer to smoking in casinos, forgetting that in most of the gaming jurisdictions, and, and I'm not an expert, but uh, uh, we have in this room uh, some, you know, important authorities in, 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 in gaming law that knows the, the legal framework of, of so many jurisdictions. In many jurisdictions, you're allowed to, to walk a gaming area where gaming is being operated, or to be seated at a baccarat or blackjack table, and, and smoke your cigar. And what we're talking about in Macau is that the government said to the operators and, 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 and put that in their bill is that forget about that. That's, that's never going to happen. So uh, it, will, it, it will never more be allowed to operate a gaming area with smoking. What we will give you, because some people in Macau um, were saying that we are, we are being a, a bit unreasonable, we will give you the, the smoking, the airport, the airport style smoking lounges. And I think that the, 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 the casino industry of Macau settled for that. In my opinion, if you ask me, perhaps they could have done better. They could have done better and they could have lobbied better and they could have negotiated better because this solution, and this is probably the most important point that I would like to bring to your attention and, 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 and you know, throw the issue at you and in, a, in perhaps a, a provocative way, this will put Macau as the most restrictive jurisdiction in the world in terms of tobacco control in casinos. Being Macau, of course, um, a jurisdiction and an economy that is so dependent on, on, on gaming and on gaming revenue, in particular in VIP gaming revenue, um, we will be probably the only jurisdiction in the world that will not allow a player to smoke and we will ask him Sir, please go through this corridor, stop your game, and, and go have a smoke if you want, and come back uh, 10 minutes later. When this is not the case in Singapore, Australia, Las Vegas, and we know how, you know, I, I mentioned these three jurisdictions because we all know how protective of the rights of the public and of the workers in particular these jurisdictions are, and how advanced they are, they don't depend, well, Las Vegas, is, Las Vegas does depend, but Singapore and, and, and Australia, prob they don't depend on, on gaming revenue as much as Macau, but still they didn't dare to go to a total prohibition in the shape that Macau is, 
considering and it will most probably uh, be passing the, the law. Manila allows smoking, Cambodia, Malaysia casinos allow smoking, Japan, we don't know, but I would be very surprised if, if Japan goes for a total prohibition of smoking uh, in the shape that Macau is doing in such a radical way. I, I would bet that they would go for a more liberal uh, Las Vegas style solution, that is the same in Portugal as well, that allows the casino to set up smoking areas, of course with all the, with all the requirements to have state-of-the-art um, systems to protect the dealers against secondhand smoke, um, but still allow the casinos to run their business in a way that is competitive and in according to the trends of the industry that is not the total prohibition that Macau will pass. In not what I would say perhaps um, a romantic, but perhaps a bit uncertain way. And this is the, um, basically what I have for you tonight to, for us to, to discuss. And um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, we will uh, now move on to the question and answer session. I'm sorry. So there will be a, a microphone. And uh, I think what we will do is uh, that uh, we will probably collect uh, a number of questions from, for different speakers and then we'll, we'll, we'll pass the, the, the floor around for answers. Let me just before that say uh, that um, another uh, thing behind today's session is, was a call for papers for, um, for a little newsletter called Asian Gaming Lawyer, which is organized by, which is published by the IMGL, International Masters of Gaming Law. And uh, the presentations that you've heard, uh, with one exception, uh, are already uh, published uh, here. There's a number of free copies available. I believe some will be over there at the end of the room. We have a few more, but anyway, this will be available online, um, I guess, in this week for sure, in, in the website uh, of the IMGL, uh, in case you, you prefer to just download uh, an electronic version. So with that, we will start the session and uh, First of all, uh, okay. I would like to thank everyone. Um, and I would address two questions. Uh, uh, one to Professor Nelson Rose. Well, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Because when we study law, of course, we learn about the indirect uh, sources of law. And when we uh, uh, learn that, we all need to know where the wind blows uh, when we are uh, facing eventual um, changes in the existing system. We need to know what's going to happen. Now, you raised one main factor, uh, which is what is happening in the United States and what is the impact that it can have uh, in our uh, jurisdiction also. Um, during the last few years, M Macau faced several changes and several restrictions um, that have impacts on the gaming in Macau. And these restrictions were not only immigration, it's also money control um, and the transfer of uh, money control. And we have just spo heard one of the restrictions uh, that have a precise impact to um, the gaming in Macau. Uh, I would ask, uh, Professor Rose, what type of new restriction, if possible, can actually eventually or can foresee to, 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 that may happen or may be imposed to Macau uh, based on this new factor that is a political one, eventually the, the arising from the 
uh, trade war that eventually may happen or not, and we never know what's going to happen the next hour when we talk about the new right. presidency. Um, and the one subsequent question I would uh, raise to uh, Dr. Francisco Gavin. Uh, when you speak about, and this like a question, opinion, I'm sorry, uh, but you spoke so much about restriction on uh, the smoking, but are we talking about the restriction of smoking or actually gambling restriction? Because the way you describe apparently has a one direct impact on the gaming industry and is not precisely focused on the smoking. Okay. Um, uh, thank maybe yeah. we can pick, we, we oh, can collect okay. a number of more questions okay. and then. So if you would like to ask a question, so there's a question over there, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you all for the presentations. I have just, uh, it's not a question, it's in order for your Dr. Bruno Ascensão, because I agree with a lot of things that he told in his presentation, but one thing I have seriously serious doubts about it, and it's regarding the deadline and um, making the, nego the negotiation procedure with the same deadline as the term of the chief executive. And my question is this. If the new concessions and if there is a change and the deadline starts being five years instead of 20 uh, to match the chief executive deadline, wouldn't this make all the chief executive uh, mandate just to deal with the uh, gaming concessions and not other issues because you would start negotiating and by the end of the mandate the concessions the concessionaires would start asking and lobbying for the renewal just with your opinion thank you um, good evening um, my question is to professor rose um, well, first of all, thank you. Thanks for, for your presentation. Thanks. It's always a pleasure to, to, to see you in Macau. Uh, it's good for us to receive people from, home, from overseas to give us their inputs on, on very important topics to our small city. Thank you so much. Um, my question is not specifically related with, with Macau gaming issues, but um, we know what's going on in Japan. We know um, I mean, how, how important that market is for a, for a gaming operator worldwide. Um, what, what do you think about the chances of um, Chinese, and when I say Chinese, I say, I say Chinese-related um, gaming operators, um, if compared with, with, with the American ones? Um, what do you think, in, 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 the, in the context of what you, what you told us and the relationships, be, that the, in the commercial relationship that now exists and the geopolitical situation, uh, how, what, what would be um, the most, uh, say, um, capable or the winning, winning, winning bid for, for, a, for, a, for a Japanese license? Would the Chinese companies will be at the same position if compared with the American ones? Um, could you please, I know this is, this, is, this, this is a lot, but if you could give us just some insights and opinions about, about, about what you think. Thanks so much. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I think that uh, Dr. Rui Cunha, through his foundations, done an excellent, if not very good job in Macau because uh, Dr. Rui Cunha came here in the 80s and he's very well known in Macau and what he's putting back into Macau through his foundation is to be commanded. I think that uh, Dr. Rui Cunha has been totally impartial in whatever he's, he's producing in this forum and I command him for that because uh, you make money in Macau, you put back money in Macau. So this forum was only made possible because of uh, Dr. Rui Cunha's foundation, and I congratulate him for that. Now, um, as far as this uh, uh, forum is concerned, this thing, 
is to do with gaming in Macau. I think that all the speakers have done excellent, very well in presenting the Macau scenario uh, when it comes to renewing the, the, the license in 2020 and 2022. Some made some reference to uh, uh, some assets that like uh, Dr. Sergio uh, Almeida Correa made to do with the assets of the casino where they will be reverted back to the government and the other personal assets will be kept uh, for whoever had put it in. And I think all this has extreme relevance to when the concession was given back a hundred years ago. And I think that's very important that we make some reference to <clears throat> historical uh, gaming uh, license in Macau. We know that uh, SDDM got his license uh, only in 1961, and <clears throat> the license was issued initially, I believe, was for 15 years, and 40 years later, SDDM still have the license until uh, 2001. Uh, 2001, when it was opened up to uh, three licenses and then subsequently six licenses. I think there's a lot of really very intricate situations that happened between 1961 and 2003. Now, one of the things that was extremely important was reverting back to the government the assets namely the building and everything else to do with the, uh, with the operation of a, of a gaming license. I think that, you know, to talk about the renewal of this license is it's not only important to talk about initially when it was determined there was only three licenses to be issued and then subsequently turn into six, three sub-concessions because the three sub-concession sub was never within the law, was just created. So if something that was created, it's got to be very difficult to untangle. So now that the license is going to be renewed in 2020 and 2022, the difficulty is, is that going to be a completely new structure? Are they going to renew the license based on the three licenses that was already issued, and then the tag on the, the other three sub license. And I think that, you know, when we talk about casino in Macau, the bloodline of Macau economy, we got to go back from way back. When to be granted a license, there was a fixed amount. Initially, it was 1 million patakas, and then when SDDM got it, it was 5 million, but that's not a percentage of the revenue. Now we are talking about the percentage of the revenue, which is in total 39%. So if we are now, if we are now going to discuss about how the license is going to be uh, renewed, obviously, the percentage and how the government is going to get how much the government is going to get out of that. Because the license is, is obviously one form of controlling how many operators can operate within this very lucrative business. Now, another thing that I really, really like to introduce is all these years, there has never been any outside influence any foreign influence in the issuing of Macau license. Now, all of a sudden, we have two full-flesh American licensed people, Wynn and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Sands, and half-licensed MGM. Now, in Macau, all of a sudden, we have a very strong American influence. Now, are we going to continue to allow a foreign influence in the issuing of license in a so lucrative business that we are talking about something like up to $2 billion 
US dollar a month of revenue to the government. Some small countries don't even see that in one entire year. So I think that we, when we start thinking about renewing of the Macau license, we gotta think about how much outside influence we want to have in this particular issue of license renewal. I think Professor Rose obviously is from America, I believe. I don't know, I haven't done any research. Uh, he spoke, his entire speech was based on Trump and whatever it is. And obviously Trump as a president only came about in the last five months or four. But the renewal of the Macau license has been going on for a long time. So I'd like to, I'd like to hear from Professor uh, Rose as to what and how much influence will American politics have in the renewal of the license in Macau? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so at this stage, let's do a round of answers. Okay. Professor Rose, go ahead. First, I have to apologize to everybody if I shocked you. Um, those of you who have heard me speak over the years know I'm usually pretty lighthearted um, and will answer every question, uh, you know, and give stories and stuff. Um, uh, frankly, I think what is happening around the world is scary. Um, and it is, it's particularly scary in the United States. But I was okay. in the Philippines a couple of years ago and um, talking to people who said, oh, we need the good old days of Fernando, uh, Ferdinand Marcos. And it was like, you know, and you look at what's going on and there's just too much feeling like the 1930s. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think we really do have a, a right to be scared. But that's not what the questions are. What the questions are, um, actually I can answer some of them. Um, I can answer the question on who's going to get the license in Japan. And the reason is, it wasn't me, it's Professor Bill Edington of the University of Nevada, Reno, who was the leading economist in the world when it came to casinos. He told me before he died a couple years ago that he'd actually studied this. And the answer is, no matter what the jurisdiction, what the proposals are, the licenses goes to the company that offers the government the most money. So that, and, and it could be a direct, okay, here's how much we're going to invest, or we're willing to give you, you know, do all these other projects or pay the highest percentage. Um, so I didn't do the study, but he did. So that's my prediction, that the company that will win, I mean, there's all sorts of factors, like Okada is there um, <clears throat> as a very major influence. But I think it was Adelson said he would, he would invest like six billion, or, right? Seven billion, ten billion, oh, then he'll get the license. Um, uh, um, assume, anyway, that's that seems to be for Japan. For the a lot of questions really dealt with trends, like what will be restrictions, what's the impact of uh, outside uh, by Americans on um, Macau. And that actually, there's some, there's some really interesting social dynamics going on that are, we're talking like multi-hundred year trends where, uh, and if you've seen what I've written and talked about before, that gambling was seen as a sin and therefore obviously it couldn't be legalized. The majority view in the world today, especially in China, but even in the rest of the world, is that gambling is a vice, which means, okay, we can legalize it, but let's put it on a mountaintop 
or out in the middle of the desert in the United States, or on the little peninsula and islands off of China. Uh, my favorite actually is in the United States. They put it on river boats and surrounded it by holy water, you know, so it made it sanit sanitize it. Um, I keep on expecting mainland China to bring back something. In fact, I thought it was going to be before the Beijing Olympics they would legalize betting on horse racing again. And, um, and they did at least reduce the penalties for illegal gambling from the death penalty to only five years, um, which is good. Um, but they still won't allow advertising and, or the collection of gambling debts. And in the United States, that finally fell for the most part, that now you can advertise and the gambling debts are mostly collectible. And same thing around the world. There's a trend, particularly because it's, it, it's kind of ridiculous to have a building that costs $2 billion and employs thousands and thousands of people to have contracts that aren't enforceable, right? I mean, so um, the trend is that there should be less restrictions on advertising. Certainly that's been certainly true in Macau, but I would think uh, on the mainland, eventually they're going to, going to break through um, less restrictions, gambling debts would be more enforceable. Like Hong Kong didn't have to go with Macau. Uh, they could have gone with mainland China, but they went with Macau. Um, but, and the trend looks, and these trends are 70 year trends. I mean, so we're clearly toward more and more liberalization, which means more and more competition. Japan was the last major um, country, uh, West leading economic country in the world that did not have casinos. So now you've got Japan. The next big markets that are completely prohibited are Brazil, which is going to have it, it looks like now. Uh, Venezuela, which is in a mess, but they'll probably have it. India only has Goa and Sikkim, but they're talking about legalizing internet gambling. Um, so, but that means more competition for Macau. Ha I don't think we're going to have a, 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 the, the backlash, the prohibition. That, that, that only comes in when there's too much gambling and there's scandals and there's some sort of a reawakened morality where they write into laws what governments can and can't not do in their private, people's private lives. And I don't see that backlash hasn't started. So we're decades away from that. Um, the other trends, though, that I think you have to look at are the wild card of technology that Things that simply didn't exist, like esports, uh, which type internet, internet gambling? Yeah, I mean, it, any int we're now into a remote gambling, interactive. They changed the rules in Nevada so that uh, basically video games can be used as slot machines. I mean, and and we have a generation the millennials, who hate to be called millennials, I'm sorry, but uh, millennials are now people under 40, right? So we're dealing with this giant cohort from 21 to 40, and they are the biggest group in society. The baby boomers, like me, are dying out. Fortunately, we're living longer, um, which is good for casinos because millennials don't like casinos. So casinos have to get millennials, they have to bring in a lot more restaurants and shows and shopping. Uh, the Galaxy Entertainment, I think, is, is the one that is really 
um, figuring this out. When in fact, they're, they're figured out, okay, I guess we, we no longer can make a majority of our money from gambling, so we're going to go that way. But millennials, except here, millennials don't carry cash. So that means you've got to figure out a way to get people to play on the machines who don't carry cash. And that leads to all sorts of problems. I, I wrote an article a few months ago that I said, nobody's thought about this, but if you don't play cash when you're playing a slot machine, that means there's more possibility that you could become a compulsive gambler because there's less tracking. There's less of a <laughs> feel, hey, I lost money. Um, there's a lot of social engineering in Australia and Nova Scotia. They put on machines uh, and Massachusetts, they, they thought about this, that the machine tells you how much you've lost, how long you've been playing, right, to protect people from themselves. By the way, I always ask this question. They did the study after they put in the restrictions. So you're playing in Australia, and after a half hour it pops up, you've been playing for a half hour and you've lost $150. What do you think the impact is? Well, everybody, they thought people would gamble less, which was true, except for one group, compulsive gamblers, who gamble more because, right, they, they feel Chase like they've got to catch up, right? So there's going to be more of this social engineering, but I think the, for the industry, the big questions are going to be Millennials and technology, uh, virtual reality gambling will be here in five years. Um, it's, it's here. I mean, they're doing it now in amusement parks where you put on the headset while you're on a roller coaster. Um, uh, and I don't know where it's going to go because we don't know what that means, right? But if it's virtual reality, it ha and it's in a casino, it has to be regulated. Um, I think there's going to be re more remote wagering. I think mo the, the days of the walking into a casino the size of a warehouse and going in front of a metal box to play are gone. Um, that for it, I shouldn't say that. They're dying out because baby boomers are living longer. So that's got still 20 or 30 years. Um, but there will be now handheld uh, slot machines on your pad, right? A dedicated pad. That has to be completely regulated. And you can take the pad to the swimming pool, right? And this has already happened. There, you've got them in California and Las Vegas. Um, that has to be regulated. Can they play it in the hotel room? So far, the answer is no, because they we're worried about children. So I guess I would say the toughest thing to be right now is a regulator, because they're, you know, uh, uh, two or three generations of technology behind. Uh, the specific question of the American influence, um, I think I think it is safe to say. Yes, the law says that Macau government has all of the power when it comes to renewing the concessions, and you are correct, the substitute concessions that don't exist um, in the law. But, but so the, the government has all the power, but there are political and economic realities. If they don't renew the American concessions and the Australian Macau will never get any foreign investment. You, you can't have somebody come in and put in a couple billion dollars and then the government says, thank you, we're not, we're, take, we're not renewing your license. So the reality is I think all six will get renewed. Uh, they'll finally put some restrictions on the number of casinos. Macau is the only gambling jurisdiction in the world which regulates operators and licenses operators, but doesn't limit where uh, the number of casinos. So that will be um, 
corrected, but I think they will all be renewed, but the government has the power, so they are going to ask for, for a lot. Um, probably not raising the taxes, but probably through some other, uh, uh, the whole list that was given, a possible, you know, uh, protect the car, your, change your carbon emissions and things like that. So that every, there's going to be face saving, but politically, there won't be an expansion, but there won't be a retraction either. Oh, smoking ban. Um, here's the interesting thing about smoking. Um, you can put like almost all human activity, of commercial basis, on a spectrum from this is good to this is really bad, right? So really bad is selling heroin to children. Okay, well, lawyers are kind of in the middle, but you know. Um, the casino, gambling is going to more and more toward the legitimate end, pushed, by the way, by the state lotteries. The government itself is promoting gambling, right? Um, smoking is the one area, marijuana is going more and more toward, okay, it's legal, it's fine, we can, you can do that. Smoking is about the only activity that is going more and more toward Oh, it's sinful, it's fil filthy, and uh, Japan now says you can't smoke on the streets in Japan. Um, I think, yeah, I would say that the smoking battle will be fought for years, but non-smoking will win. Thank you. I'm going to pass the floor to the other side uh, for addressing the questions that touched upon reversion, uh, concessions, subconcessions. Let, let me just answer very quickly uh, Nunu's question on, on smoking. Right. And I agree with Professor Rowe, smoking, uh, non-smoking will win. It's the trend um, right. that you see worldwide for public health uh, reasons. I just don't think the Macau casinos should be the pioneer and, uh, of that. Uh, when the tendency in the industry worldwide, and in particular the regional competition, is still not there. Can I ask why, of all places, it was Macau? You know, when you, this, when you come to Asia, you know, I, I first came in 1986, you would not think this would be the place where they would have <laughs> bans on smoking. Correct. Not even Singapore went there. Uh, right. I so w was, there, was it politics? What happened? Probably the difficulty of, of the government to deal with, the, with um, you know, le legitimate um, concerns of, of some sectors of the, of the society mm -hmm. and um, the need to, to please them, and, and probably that would be my, my, my guessing. But Nun to, to address Nunu's question, I, I, was, I was always talking about the, the total prohibition of, of a, a, a patron walking a gaming floor or sitting at a table or slots machines to be able to smoke. So we're talking about the licensed gaming areas uh, approved by the government, the casinos, the VIP rooms. The, 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 that, that's, that's what, that's what I, I, I refer to when, I, when, when I'm talking about the, the, the total ban. The smoking lounges is just a diversion that was introduced by the, the, the so radical first draft of the health department that was contemplating even the prohibition for the casinos to have airport style smoking lounges. And that introduced the noise in the discussion and the casinos were so afraid of that that they probably thought that the cause of having um, gaming operations with smoking was lost and let's just concentrate in convincing these people and, and, and get our, 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 our friends and, and other sectors of the society more reasonable to support us and to tell the health department that to have casinos, you know, huge casinos in Kotai without airport style smoking lounges was just crazy. So, Sergio and Buri, would you like to comment on issues of reversion? Tax, tax issues came, came up in the, in the discussion a little bit, and uh, maybe some other comments you may have on, uh, on your two presentations, which of course share a, a common 
a common uh, area, a common routine. Thank you, Professor. Well, about was what was said by Mr. Wish. As far as I remember, well, the legal framework for sure has to change with or without renewal of the concession because this framework we have now is not appropriate. But I, I'm not so confident as it is Professor Rose that all six concessions, food concessions, will get renewed. For sure, <laughs> for, for, for sure, for sure, the, uh, the concessionaires and subconcessionaires will start lobbying very soon because any investor would like to know uh, what comes in the future in a very certain time. Uh, but I believe that uh, the model we have today in Macau is not the only one. I mean, in some other concessions, I'm not referring to gaming concessions, but it's something that we, we should also at least to think about. Um, governments sometimes, they, they, they decide to, to start um, partnerships with uh, private investors. So you may have a different model because when those concessionaires and sub arrived in Macau, they knew already that they have a certain time to, to get their profits, to make the investments and to get their profits back. So the extension, the five years period extension, uh, up in my view, could be used very easily by the Macau government. And at the meantime, they change the model. They can incorporate a company to do what the consumers and sub are doing. And they can invite present concessionaires and sub to take a share in those companies. Okay, but this is only an hypothesis. You can think about it. Um, but I wouldn't be so sure about what Professor Rose said. Besides this, we also should remember that uh, President Trump was elected for a four years term last November, 2016. So, Concessions will finish on 2020 and 2022. And I'm not sure that President Trump will get if he finishes the first, the second term. Mm -hmm. um, so about this, I would like to say anything else. But, uh, okay, I think we have already a lot of things to think about. I, I think you're right um, about the five-year extension because... It's 2017, and actually, we are already at the deadline because of the bonds. Companies that issue bonds, people want to know that the bond is going to be repaid. And so uh, those decisions are being made now uh, by bondholders. And I don't see any bond you know, dropping it out, out the bottom by saying, oh, my God, they're going to lose their concession. But... I like the five year and the um, a chance to redo the model. I don't think, assuming nothing horrible happens like I laid out, I don't see that Trump would actually have any influence on the renewal of, say, uh, Steve Wynn or Sheldon Adelson. Um, it's just it's too far in the future, and and he's not going to be reelected. So. I agree with you. I just wish to uh, <clears throat> to answer or to uh, comment on my colleague uh, Philippe Figueiredo's uh, question regarding the term of the uh, chief executive and uh, if the five-year five-year term of the uh, concessions is enough 
to negotiate and, and carry and carry the obligations that the government uh, may um, impose on, on, on such concessionaires. But obviously, it, it, it's not much time, uh, but I would like to remind that Chinese are, are very good at setting five-year plans <laughs> and, and um, have extensive uh, experience with that. Um, it, it's, it's obviously, when we are talking about five-year contracts, we're not we're not talking about the same level of negotiation that that happened in 2002, especially because the different it was a completely different landscape at the time. So, uh, <clears throat> setting goals for five years is easier, and um, it, it's 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 also um, important to take into consideration that um, it's going to be a a window of opportunity to a lot of people. And the fastest and the, um, the most dynamic to um, give assurances that they will uh, fulfill the obligations set by the government will obviously get the license, the concession. Thank you very much. I think we are out of time because it's already past nine o'clock and uh, this is where our session uh, should end. So um, let me, before I finish up, I just do a small comment. Go ahead, go ahead. My best forecast is that uh, Trump will give away gambling to North Korea, sink, but they have casinos. sink uh, South Korea, a country of <laughs> addicts, uh, Japan goes bust because uh, all the investment goes down. China is in trouble. <laughs> and uh, th this will just um, change the world order. <laughs> My best forecast. Or, on the other hand, um, things here will stabilize because I think, let me just say a few things about the, the future perspectives. I think we, 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 it's still very early days to, to say things in, very, in a very clear terms. But in general, the, in historical perspective, things have changed. What do I mean uh, by this? Historically, in 1961-62, it was clear that uh, we wanted more. There were not enough hotels. We wanted quality uh, hotels. And the Hotel Lisboa opened its doors to the public in 1970. And it was regarded as stunning, as, as, a, as a major achievement. 40 years later, in 2001, 2002, it was clear we want more. We want three. Actually, then we want six. And the properties that we all know and were named and got built. And uh, now we are approaching an air, a time in which do we want more? Do we? Where? Where is the land? Can the city take take take? much more tourism, where is the infrastructure, and so on. Do we really want more? Maybe things have changed, and uh, th there is no land. I mean, it's, it's very obvious. So uh, we, we reached a, a juncture. The evolution of, of uh, gaming regulation is as its twists and turns, its policy changes, and the public interest in 2020 is not going to be exactly, I suppose, the public interest where it was in 2001, 2002, or in 1961-62. So that's just a very general observation, but possibly that, that will change the conversation a little bit. Um, with that, we have reached the end of the sixth annual review of Macau Gaming Law. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, it was a pleasure.